somebody brought up the question, how are you going to go back into the office after COVID and after George Floyd? Like it's, it's, it should be a different office and the conversations um, should be more open. And like, we can't let this rest. We have to continue the conversations because that's the way it's going to get better. And then we have to look on how we need to take action on these conversations. We can't just talk about it and go in circles. So I'm working with my internal group, HR and others to see what actions we can take and whether that's through product development or whether that's through actually recruitment, how we can get more faces of color to contribute to um, Tarquette and be aware of Tarquette. I'd like to be the first to welcome you to Design Nerds Anonymous, the podcast that sparks curiosity at the intersection of business and design. I'm your host, Amanda Schneider, founder and president at ThinkLab, the research division of Sandow, and sister company to design brands you know and love, like Interior Design, Metropolis, Material Bank, and more. And I'd like to be the second person to welcome you to Design Nerds Anonymous. My name is Hannah Vitti, and I've been Amanda's right hand throughout the season. I'm the audio journalist engineer producing Design Nerds Anonymous with ThinkLab. You'll hear my voice throughout the season. In this podcast, we've invited trailblazers from within the design industry and beyond to engage in conversations and explore the topics that will drive our future. At ThinkLab, our passion is sharing inspiration for your business, fuel for your design process, and connections with people and ideas for positive disruption. So thanks for listening. We're glad you're here. This spring, life as we knew it paused. With many of us stagnant on lockdown, there was one issue that we could no longer avoid. Racial dynamics, diversity, and inclusion in this country. The wrath of racism and other exclusionary politics based on identity has seeped into nearly every aspect of our culture, or at least awareness of it, right? And unfortunately, that includes the design industry. Now here are some staggering statistics. According to the Census Bureau, just over 13% of the population identifies as Black. Yet, in design schools, only 6% of design students are Black, and less than 5% of practicing designers are Black. That's a big problem, for more reasons than one episode can tackle. But today, we share the experience of one Black designer and other people who devoted their lives to striving for diversity within the design industry. Now, in 2020, Many of us are feeling passionate, yet helpless. And we're here to tell you that, like the design process, it all starts by listening and understanding various perspectives. So let's dive in. The voice you heard in the intro was from Libby Gillen. Libby is a well-known and beloved designer turned rep who currently holds the title of Vice President of Strategy, Architecture and Design at Tarkat. Because she's so beloved in the industry, I'm guessing many of you listening already know her, but I'm also guessing that even those of you who do know her have never heard this story. And Libby, we thank you for sharing this so publicly. Um, our manufacturing is in the South. Like um, we are in Dalton, Georgia for one plant and then uh, Florence, Alabama. And I told my boss once, I mean, just recently, and he had was not aware. I go, when I, I fly to... Nashville and I drive two hours because then I don't have to change planes or anything. I go that hour and a half drive is so scary to me because I'm on smaller highways going to Florence, Alabama by myself. I go, would you ever think that's a factor? You drive all over yourself. Would you ever think that was a factor? And it, 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 it's, I mean, I haven't been there in a while now, obviously, but I go, every time I go, I have to like put my big girl boots on and, and, and do it. But I, you know, I'm going the speed limit. I'm not, I'm doing everything right to not be pulled over or, you know, make sure I've got gas and provisions. I don't want to stop and have to get soda or go to the bathroom. You know, I just want to get there. I feel comfortable within my manufacturing plant and within the offices. <laughs> it sounds kind of funny and my kids laugh at me, but I'm like, I've been woke um, in that I see a need to get more people of color within my company and get more designers 
um, promoted or seen in a different way because I do have a lot of friends out there who just kind of feel stuck at the position they're at and they should be able to be elevated and they should feel very good about what they're doing. Um, and then even that next level down of students. Throughout this episode, you'll hear quite a bit about students and design school. As you heard in the intro, there's definitely a lack of racial diversity in design schools. But it's even more stark when you enter the professional field. Let's hear more of Libby's perspective. So one of the things that I noticed when I was interviewing in Chicago with ISI at the time, I saw so many faces of color. And that was not the case in Boston. I worked for John Hancock in a tower, and it was very homogenous. Um, there was some diversity, but not. I mean, it's John Hancock. You'd think there'd be more diversity, and it wasn't. It wasn't that. I say great, but it, Boston is very segregated at the same time. So when I moved to Chicago, and I walked into this place where there was like the receptionist was black, and the, uh, one of the architects I. I met with was black and then I could got a tour through the studio and I saw a lot of brown faces. I was like, all right. And then I found out the comptroller, one of the executives was a black woman. And I'm like, this is refreshing. <laughs> By working there, I was exposed to more people of color, men and women, architects and interior designers who helped me, who um, made me more comfortable in my skin. Um, I didn't, I was much more about my, especially my early career, well, first finding a job, like the fact that I found a job at John Hancock, I was very thankful for, but then being able to be creative and be able to get my skills honed and be able to prove that I could do interior design. And it wasn't about being a woman, black woman in the field. It was about proving myself as a young designer. It wasn't until later in her career that she found a peer group that helped build her confidence and network. But when I got to Chicago, I felt more affirmed. Um, because it was a bigger network. And um, one Neocon, I was walking down one of the corridors and this woman stopped me and she goes, are you an interior designer or an architect? I'm like, black woman. She goes, we're getting a group together. It's called Organization of Black Designers. Will you come to our happy hour? And I was like, heck yeah. You know, I'm like, I never knew this existed. And it was a group, it was based in Washington, DC, but it was a group of Black designers, graphic, fashion, interiors, ad designers, like a whole group. What, the people I met at first were much more grounded in interiors because it was Neocon. But it was amazing to see this body of people of color from all over the country at the time. And it was, I mean, literally it was like, I, I like 20 people. It wasn't like a huge group, but <clears throat> that was still affirming, you know, so many in a brown, with, she saw me, brown face, walking down the corridor and she picked me up, plucked me out of the group. And um, that helped me build my network and confidence as well. Sadly, if you look at the history of this country, design has unfortunately been a tool towards creating racial and class divides. Here's AJ Perone, EVP and design futurist with Sandow reminding us about where the origins of the design industry came from. And if you look at the history of interior design, which I actually did an exhibit at the Goldstein Gallery on the history of interior design, it was a profession of the wealthy. I mean, if you were an interior designer, it, you came from a wealthy family, you had, you had connections to other wealthy families, and that's how interior design started. It was really about who you knew, the connections that you had, and it was a privilege. Design was only for the privilege. And so, you know, we have that kind of historical mindset about interior design. So, while uncomfortable to consider, let's hope it means that designers can be the group that takes the divide and tears it down. When we talk about diversity, in this current moment, race should be at the forefront of the discussion. However, when we embrace racial diversity, we actually create space for radical acceptance for so many different people and ideas. A 2014 paper by the American Institute of Graphics Arts perhaps said it best. 
Race is only part of the picture. Diversity in design means diversity of experience, perspective, and creativity, otherwise known as diversity of thought. And these can be shaped by multiple factors, including race, ethnicity, gender, age, sexual identity, ability, and location, among other things. The diversity problem in design is not only in the numbers, but also in the lack of diverse role models, opportunities, and frankly, awareness, which leads to apathy, insensitivity, and sometimes even outright discrimination. So we wanted to share some additional conversations, specifically around gender and neurodiversity. The idea of tearing down the divides of harmful design has been a huge part of AJ's life. She has a son with severe autism. Google Devin Wilds. You won't regret it. Hint, he's now an Emmy Award winner. And AJ's been advocating for the marginalized neurodivergent population for her entire career. I've been, I've been actually looking at this issue of diversity and inclusion for a long time. And um, obviously I have a, a deep passion for neurodiversity, but any marginalized community, you know, is where I've been focusing some time and effort. And to me, the, the challenge is, is that, you know, we need those home economic teachers back that taught design in school. Like, There's so many populations that don't even know what design is. Now, as we look at diversity in design, let's add one more. Gender diversity. Now think of the designers you know. Largely female, right? In fact, according to the ThinkLab Industry Benchmark Study, the design industry is 54% female. But we know that those numbers shift dramatically as we look into leadership positions. Let's hear from Kay Sargent, Director of Workplace at HOK. You know, just the disparity in our, uh, in our ranks right now. And you could argue the same thing about women, right? Like women are more than 50% of the workforce, but they're less than 4% of the C-suite. Um, but I, somebody told me once there are 358, and I, I hope that number has increased, but at the time, and it was less than two years ago, there are only 358 registered female Black architects in the entirety of the United States. And whether we're talking about gender or racial diversity, part of the solution is tackling the diversity problem from the ground up. So part of the problem is that the pool is not big enough to draw from. And everybody is attacking it at the top end of this by saying we need to Uh, include more, I really think it's a systemic issue starting at the bottom of this. I mean, I want you to think about this. Do you know any child, any child that doesn't build buildings or blocks or play or design when they're kids? Do you know any child that doesn't do that? Do you know any child that is in kindergarten that doesn't think they're an amazing artist? Yet somehow our school system beats this out of them. And by the time they're in sixth grade, they don't even know about the profession of architecture or design, and or most of them don't think they can draw anymore. So there is something in our education system that is not funneling viable candidates to this cause. And unless we change and address that, the pool will never be big enough. But it's up to us to speak up on behalf of others. Now, I've been a part of many discussions lately about what we, as an industry, can do to help around the issue of diversity and inclusion. And my key takeaway is, the biggest thing we can do is get aware, understand privilege, and use our voice wherever and whenever possible to use that privilege to support our colleagues and our community. So let's hear a bit more on the gender diversity perspective from Kay. My generation was really one of the first generations where women were truly, openly encouraged to go to college and have a profession and a career. And I believe that 40 or 50 years ago, we fundamentally changed the way that we raised our daughters. We encouraged them to go out, be bolder, take on more initiative. 
we never changed the way we raised our sons. And I think fundamentally today, part of the challenge that we have is that. And so if we really truly want to address this problem, it's not just about right, bringing up women and, and raising women differently and empowering women. Legal progress around gender required men who had the right to vote to stand up for women. They had to use their privilege of voting to allow others to do the same. And perhaps the same concept applies to all areas. Educating ourselves, using our voice and our vote, empowering design students, and raising the next generation of children to respect difference. But it starts with acknowledging and discussing. Here's AJ again. So when we talk about inclusion, it it has to start with young kids. It has to start with, you know, just as we've made huge strides of STEM and STEAM for for young girls, especially, and getting them to be, be more advanced in those areas, we have to do the same with design. You have to go out into the community and get these people to bring them in because guess what they're not going to just show up that's not it's not unfortunately how our society is and how our school systems are you have to teach them that design has value and it's not about picking colors right there's a lot of different things that go along with design and it's appropriate for boys it's appropriate for girls it's you know I've heard stories of um, young males that are gay that don't want to be an interior designer, even though they're super talented because they don't want to be the stereotype. And I was like, huh, never thought of it that way. But, you know, we have to break down these barriers and, and we have to do everything that we can to find these people, get them interested, get these, you know, these kids interested in design. And guess what? The art saves so many people. Because if you're not good at math and science, but you might be a really creative thinker, there could be a really good job for you in design. We feel like this is a common theme, sparking curiosity about design and helping students of all diverse backgrounds realize design could be an option for them. Let's hear more from Libby about that spark. Kids coming out of school might say, oh, I want to do advertising sales or I want to sell software or whatever, that's one thing, but to even know what sales of interior architecture products are or flooring or lighting um, and and how rewarding it can be because you are adding to the environment. So what do you believe are some of the major barriers to equity um, in the design world as it stands? Well, the barriers are just number one, promoting the positions available in interior and architecture. I knew what I wanted, but an example is when I was in Chicago working, I was a mentor for crew. I I mentored kids at Martin Luther King High. And this one woman, she was a black woman, she, girl, she wanted to be an architect. She kept saying she wanted to be an architect. So they paired us together. I brought her to architectural firm. She had no idea really what an architecture was. I don't know if she saw it in a movie or what her aspirations really were, but when I told her, you know, do you have a math background? Do you, do you have an engineering background? Do you like geometry? Do you like art? Do you, and she's like, no, no, no. So I, I don't think that's, she did go to college, but I don't, that's not what she was pursuing. Um, I think to educate and, and sponsor younger people to learn what it's all about is very important. What, interior design, what architecture, even what sales is. I see advocacy in that, but then also mentoring, sponsoring peer groups of people, you know, people of color at all stages. I also like to say that, you know, there's mentorship, but then there's also learning from your peers, sponsorship. I'm working with a gal that's newly graduated from Brown and, you know, she was floundering a little bit when she came to Austin after graduation, or actually way before graduation. And um, I've been helping her with her portfolio. And I've been trying to, you know, get her name out there. She's got a great story as well. We'll 
we'll come back to Libby's mention of that student from Brown in a big way. But first, like we say to our workplace clients, it's not just about recruiting, it's about retention. Listen to the excitement in Libby's voice as she talks about connecting with her peers as part of an IIDA panel. Imagine for a moment how you could foster something like this in your region, in your company, or for the industry at large. Um, I did a call with uh, Cheryl Durst, and we had 55 women, happened to be all women, on a Zoom call from as far as Hawaii, couple in Canada. Yeah, it was really cool. And then we found out there are subgroups in that. Like there's a bunch of Gensler people, black designers, female designers who were from Gensler that didn't know each other. So we kind of now networked all that. And then even there was a group of women who were from the Caribbean. So again, a sub segment of black designers who are all from the Caribbean, but now working in the States or somewhere. So that was really cool, but that was, you know, that wasn't mentoring. That was just bringing group together to, to network and, and talk and, you know, feel good about where we are in our day-to-day business. And that was more about business and being an advocate. There isn't like within my company, there's another one black woman who is a salesperson within my company. And we, especially, you know, during these times, we've talked a lot because we feel alone in that we are outward facing and nobody had any idea not you know what we go through on daily basis is and not all bad but just in general whether it be personal or within our workplace i also did a lot of um design thinking training so that again is collaborative and you really have to put your your feet in the other person's shoes empathetically and understand where they're coming from. So it's not always, you know, like that said, this top down um, directive, It, it should be more collaborative and inclusive. Inclusivity really has to come from understanding and a commitment to recognizing and validating difference. Here's Kay again, talking about her research on neurodiversity. Kay's an industry veteran and been leading research on neurodiversity at HOK and designing spaces to be inclusive of the neurodivergent. Do you mind briefly um, giving us a definition of neurodivergent and neurotypical? Yeah, I I would just say that neurodivergents are people that are wired differently. But we would argue everybody is wired differently, right? Neurodivergents tend to um, be people that are on the spectrum for autism, have ADHD, Tourette's, on, you know, Parkinson's. They tend to have heightened neurosensitivities, whether it's hypo or hyper. And neurotypicals tend to be kind of like in the middle. Probably three or four years ago, one of our clients asked us, how do you design for people that are ADHD? And we had some information and we shared some, but we realized that it was really, truly lacking in depth. There's a plethora of information about how to design for kids in elementary school, but you don't outgrow it. It's not something that when you hit 18, all of a sudden it's cured. And what happens, though, is that beyond elementary school and maybe, you know, maybe a little bit into high school, it's addressed. But after that, it really isn't. People that are neurodivergent have some challenges, but they also have amazing skill sets. And the challenges, and there's a great quote from one of the students, uh, it's something along the lines of, we're freshwater fish. And if you put us in fresh water, we'll do fine. But if you put us in salt water, we'll struggle to survive. That's what's happening. When you try to understand difference and when you include all perspectives, you actually benefit the mean. And this applies not only to neurodivergent design. Instead, it acknowledges all the diversity within our communities and promotes inclusive collaboration. Our team repeatedly throughout the research that we've done has kind of looked at each other and said, 
I'd benefit from that space. And I'm not neurodivergent, but I want options and choices. And so you don't have to be on that neurodivergent spectrum on the extreme ends, even people in the middle, the neurotypicals. And I think Mar Baum, one of my colleagues, said it really, really well. When you design for the extreme, you benefit the mean. And we believe that. So if we can design spaces that give people more options and choices, that allow them to find the setting that is right for their sensitivity and enables them to feel safe and comfortable, then we can create spaces that benefit everybody, not just people that are neurodivergent, but everybody. No matter who you're designing for, it comes down to asking questions and trying to understand diverse needs. In turn, you validate that person and their unique experience. I've always had a very strong feeling that the users need to be represented. And I go as so as far as when I'm working on, like especially schools or therapy units for autism, most of these kids are nonverbal. And I still find a way that they can participate in their needs, even being nonverbal, where it's taking pictures and it's, a, it's actually a program, it's an autism program on an iPad, but you can load in all the pictures and ask, have them make choices and they're used to using that. So they're actually choosing what rooms they prefer and we take that feedback and we put it in account because you know what, their voice matters as well. So it doesn't matter if it's someone that's cleaning the bathrooms or if it's someone that's working in the space, or if it's the president and the CEO, everyone's needs should matter. And people need to have a voice. And sometimes the designer has to be that advocate and be that voice because the timing isn't there, the, um, the access to the people isn't there, or it's just you know the matter of value engineering. And so, you know, the bathroom conversations have gotten really interesting in companies right now, right? Yeah. And, you know, should we, should we have it all together? And if it is all together, how do, you know, if it's unisex, how do we still add privacy? And how does it not get awkward? And I mean, there's so many different conversations that go into that. And we're just on the tip of some of the, the research and information coming out. And if we can find ways like this, to get the input of nonverbal children with autism. It seems no matter what kind of diversity we're designing for, it comes down to listening. And that is a huge foundational part of the design process. Needs analysis, which is what designers do best after all. You know, the challenge is it's, it's always time, time and money to get really good needs analysis. But especially if we want to be more inclusive and we want to look at diversity and we look, want to look at um, creating spaces that are user friendly for whoever type of user you are, right? You, you have to be able to um, have that mindset. So there's something that I talk a lot about called design empathy. And what design empathy, how I defined it is you have to realize how you're experiencing a space, how you see space, how you see color, how lighting affects you, how smell affects you. All the, you know, we design to the five senses. And guess what? Your senses can be off. Like I might be able to hear something that you can't hear because I can hear a pitch or two that's a little higher, right? And so there might be a fan that's running that's driving me insane and you can't even hear it and you think I'm crazy. So design empathy is really looking at me trying to be in that person's shoes that is having a completely different experience than what I would be having, right? It's very easy as a designer to design a space that you would like and that you would enjoy and that fits your needs. It's very hard for you to like think about things that look innocuous to you that could be actually barriers to someone else and be in that mindset of, gee, you know, if that's there, that could cause a problem for these types of people. In 
and there is so much listening to be done, especially as it relates to the topic of diversity and inclusion today. On that front, we want to invite you to listen to our special bonus episode. Remember earlier when Libby mentioned that student from Brown? Well, we interviewed her and her story and insights were so inspiring and important. We wanted to share it all with you directly. My name is Alana Van. I am 22 years old and I just graduated from Brown University. So we hope you'll do your part, starting with listening to Alana's bonus episode included in this season. We're honored to share her personal story, which covers, yes, racial diversity, but also diversity of experience, perspective, and creativity, shaped by multiple factors from race to ethnicity, gender, age, sexual identity, ability, and geographic location. We think you'll be inspired. Special thanks to our interviewees in this episode, Libby Gillen, Kay Sargent, AJ Perrone, and to Blue Dot Sessions for the music. Thanks for listening.